Welcome to this uh, workshop on China in the Balkans. And I'm really um, very grateful to, to Janka and to Vlado uh, for um, taking me up on this idea. Uh, and welcome most of all to our friends from the Balkans who have joined today and who have been helping us all along uh, this endeavor. Uh, it's, it's really great to have you. Um, we thought that the Balkans are a special space of, of um, experimenting. Both, I think, the Chinese have been experimenting how far they can get, but also I think the, the West is, uh, is kind of facing that experiment. We'll have to make up their mind, I mean, whether we will react, uh, how we would push back and so on. Uh, and this is why we thought that uh, this project but also this conversation that we're going to have now is very, very interesting uh, and very timely. With this, I am going to give the floor immediately to Janka, who is the director of uh, ECFR's Asia and China program, and he's going to take us through the discussion today. Thanks a lot, Janka, for agreeing to do this. Thank you, Vesela, and, and thank you to all of you for joining us here to the event that's called China in Europe's Periphery, How China Became a Power in the Western Balkans. The topic, as uh, Vesela has already said, uh, is of key relevance for the conversation today, not only um, for Europe-China relations in the future, but also sort of for European strategy in the future and for kind of where China is actually going to be successful or not successful. We're very, very grateful for the support of our partners in this endeavor, the Rockefeller Brothers Fund and the Balkan Trust for Democracy. I see Mia Vukievich and Natasha Petrovic here. We're delighted to have you with us today and please engage in the conversation as much as you can. Um, I think the topic has shown that especially in the case of Serbia, uh, there were many questions uh, around the coronavirus crisis, Chinese mask diplomacy, vaccine diplomacy. Um, all of this seemed to be highly successful. But this has only been kind of like the most prominent example of China's political, economic, and diplomatic inroads in the Western Balkans. I am very glad that my colleague Vladimir Shapov has decided to go beyond these headlines uh, and to get to the bottom of what is really going on in the region. Um, he engaged in what I would call a fact-finding operation under not always the easiest conditions because the pandemic has made his life a lot harder than it was supposed to be. Um, and he has explored the relationship beyond the mere economic dimension. Um, he takes a closer look at the emerging political, social, and cultural links as well that make this a lot more problematic than just an investment relationship. The result is an excellent report that you have hopefully all already seen, and if not, we'll be able to read uh, after this event. Um, we will definitely be sure to send it around. Um, but. Uh, I wanted to just give you a quick introduction of who uh, Vladimir Shapov is. He's a visiting fellow with the Asia program at ECFR. Um, he is currently teaching on Asian affairs in the politics department of Sofia University as an adjunct professor and has been a foreign affairs columnist at Forbes Bulgaria since 2011. He's a co-founder and columnist of Reduta.bg, a Bulgarian website for analytical journalism and is an all around Asia wonk. Uh, from the region and has been entirely helpful in making people like me who sit in Berlin, Paris and uh, Brussels um, understand that there's a lot more to this conversation that we sometimes see from what is called the big capitals. We will go into um, Vlado's uh, presentation right after this. Um, he will have about 15 minutes presenting the finding of his report and after that we're very delighted that uh, Stefan Vladis Love you. I hope I get it correct. <laughs> From the Belgrade Fund for Political Excellence will provide um, a comment on the finding. And Stefan is one of the key observers of Serbia-China relations, has made quite a name for himself in that regard over the last few years. And it's a great honor and pleasure to welcome him here today. We were just talking in the beginning. It's been more than two, three years that we've seen each other last in Belgrade, um, it's time that travel can resume so these conversations can actually take place again. We will then have plenty of time for an open debate among all of the participants. Please note that this meeting is on the record um, and please use either the raise hand button or the just drop me a note in the chat so that I can kind of get you into the conversation. We will end at 
uh, 3.30 my time sharp. Um, and uh, I thank you all for joining us at this stage, taking time um, at this, at least in Berlin, very sunny day. And without further ado, Vlado, I would hand the floor to you. Thank you, Janka. Thanks very much. And thanks to uh, all of you that have taken time to participate in our workshop today. And actually, I would like to start by expressing my uh, gratitude to many of the people who have joined us today because uh, I was actually able to travel around the region, as you, Janka, mentioned, under pretty extreme uh, circumstances. But uh, I was actually able to talk mostly face-to-face -face with over 90 uh, people from across the region. Uh, and, uh, you know, I do have to say that, in fact, uh, a lot of the content uh, of, the, of this report uh, is due to these interactions, and I'm really, really grateful for that. Um, but I actually also have to say that traveling under such circumstances was incredibly fun, because I, almost, I felt at times as if I had the region to myself. There was hardly anyone at the borders. Uh, uh, lots of the city centers were unusually quiet, but it also meant that people had plenty of time uh, and they were not traveling. So in fact, I really was able to, uh, uh, to meet uh, most of the people that I really did want to meet um, uh, during, uh, during that uh, research trip. Uh, before I focus on uh, some of the main findings, and uh, I do hope that you have seen the report or that you will see the report because it has a lot of detail that obviously I cannot uh, get into, uh, I would initially say a couple of things about the intent of this, uh, of this project because it was, uh, I mean, our basic idea was to, to combine a kind of, kind of effort at mapping uh, uh, the, the situation vis-a-vis uh, -vis China's presence uh, uh, in the region, uh, and also, but, but also on the basis of that mapping exercise, uh, reconceptualizing and refocusing uh, a lot of uh, what uh, has been written over the past uh, couple of years, because you know we we did feel that there was some pretty clear uh, conceptual shortcomings. Uh, and certain underappreciated elements and components of China's, uh, of China's presence. And we basically approached the, the entire exercise uh, with, this analytical, with this analytical intention. And uh, as you will see, probably, and you will notice in the report, uh, this is actually well reflected in the structure, in the content, and also in the language of the, of the report itself. So let me start with a couple of uh, kind of key findings um, uh, which are highlighted also in the report itself. Well, the first one is that we really did find sufficient evidence uh, that China's uh, presence in the region is much more multifaceted uh, that we have been, that we have been um, uh, expecting. Uh, so although a lot of the focus has been quite rightly over the last decade on big infrastructure projects, on the economy, uh, on energy and all the rest of it, uh, there is plenty of evidence uh, that Chinese engagement is now spilling over well beyond the field of economy. Uh, public diplomacy is, cr is clearly on the, on the up. Uh, there is much more uh, much greater presence of China in the regional media in terms of content, in terms of the projection of, uh, uh, of narratives. Uh, there is much greater engagement in the areas of uh, research, uh, academia, uh, even at the level of uh, civil society already. We are finding in a couple of countries that you know, local Chinese actors, Chinese embassies, uh, are increasingly engaging with civil society um, uh, organizations. Of course, nothing comparable to the, to the scale of this type of interaction between Western uh, countries and, and the countries in the region, but pretty much well on its way in adopting a similar kind of uh, posture. Also, a lot of a significant uptick in terms of uh, institutional, state, the state institutional um, 
uh, relationships, uh, although these are much more difficult to track, and of course that has been a major uh, issue throughout the, 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 the research, uh, and, but this will not be a uh, surprise to you, the fact that it's, it is quite difficult to find uh, good information, reliable information, uh, on China's activities in the region, but I don't, I don't need to specifically underline that for, for, for our, for our uh, audience today. So, much more multifaceted presence. The second major finding is that, uh, and this was, you know, a bit, of a, a bit of a surprise, I have to say, that this presence is uh, getting more and more embedded. Uh, in other words, uh, what is now happening is that we are beginning to have interaction which goes beyond seemingly ad hoc uh, engagements uh, or, or formalized uh, uh, occasions uh, at, the, at the state level and, uh, and, and, and all the rest of it. So in other words, we are finding more and more evidence of horizontal uh, linkages. Uh, we're finding more and more evidence of interconnectedness. Uh, uh, and uh, I, 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 chose, I chose to describe this uh, as emerging nexuses uh, of cooperation. And by that, I mean uh, uh, the integration of activities in different sectors where China is engaging. Uh, so, for instance, linkages between academ academic cooperation uh, involving uh, China and civil society and media activities. So, for instance, in Bosnia, we have such, uh, uh, we have such an example between this interplay between academic research, um, public activity, PR. Uh, you know, we, having, we have a lot of instances now of uh, uh, interlinkages between uh, business interests and, and media, presence, in some cases even media ownership. Uh, so so I, I, I do think it is useful uh, in terms of how we conceptualize China's presence uh, to start thinking about the right way of describing these more horizontal, more stabilized and increasingly institutionalized linkages between cooperation in different, in different sectors. Uh, the third sort of major finding has to do with the quite, quite impressive uh, flexibility with which China is actually uh, implementing its uh, strategies of engagement uh, in the region. Of course, there is great variance, and we can discuss that further in the Q&A session. Um, but clearly, China is learning very quickly. Uh, there, is, uh, there is diplomatic rotation you know, throughout, uh, throughout the region. Uh, you know, there is significant situational agility in terms of responding uh, to opportunities as they arise in kind of day-to-day, -day, everyday uh, interactions uh, on, the, on the ground. And, uh, and I think this was quite, quite an interesting observation to make, especially as I was sort of moving from, uh, from, country, from country to country. The fourth major uh, finding, I think, is the presence of a multi-level strategy of engagement. Uh, and again, again, I do think that we need to gradually shift and to kind of transition away from this almost exclusive focus on the macro level of engagement, sort of meetings between prime ministers, presidents, big G2G events, cooperation agreements, and all the rest of it. Yes, they've been important. Yes, they have been significant over the last decade or so. Uh, but there is increasing, uh, there is increasing evidence uh, of engagement at, a whole, at the whole range of institutions uh, and levels within each of these, uh, of these countries. It means more and more cooperation at the regional level, more and more cooperation with uh, localities, uh, with municipalities, uh, uh, with all sorts of institutions. I briefly touched upon, upon briefly touched upon that. Uh, so it really does make sense now to start, you know, conceptualizing uh, China's engagement through the lens of this uh, multi-level, multi-level uh, strategy. Uh, and the fifth finding. Uh, has to do with the fact that there's been an enormous increase in terms of the points of entry and points of engagement. Uh, 
I mean, in, in again, this is a kind of a follow-on from uh, from some of the previous points that I made, but I do think that it, this deserves deserves specific uh, specific at attention uh, because it also gan goes hand in hand with a notable increase in the pace of engagement, in the intensity of uh, uh, of this engagement. Uh, which also has, depending on which country you look at and depending on which time horizon you you adopt, has a very peculiar pattern because sometimes you're kind of witnessing times of kind of bilateral relationships plateauing and then suddenly there would be an outburst of, uh, of uh, engagement or, or, or of interest. So, for instance, in one country which is politically beyond... Um, uh, beyond the Western Balkans, uh, you know, uh, Croatia, suddenly, just out of the blue, after s a seemingly prolonged period of kind of platooning bilateral relations, there was a sudden attempt by Chinese actors to acquire the main media organization in the country, you know, without kind of a, a great deal of obvious sort of warning signs that we, m you know, there might be uh, that there might be uh, uh, such uh, uh, such an interest in the in the offing, so the character of this engagement also I think deserves uh, and this particular pulsating nature of this engagement I think also deserves uh, you know deserves our our attention uh, so, so now if you briefly allow me to uh, allow me to say a couple of kind of make a couple of points on some wider trends we sort of go beyond the major findings of the uh, uh, of the of the uh, of the project well the first one is that we have clearly left the kind of entry re-entry phase of uh, in chinese engagement in the region and i think china is is you know really on the cusp of being able to exercise some real leverage uh, in certain countries, in certain areas, and at certain points in time. You know, whether it be as, uh, you know, an occasion to renegotiate uh, an enormous uh, 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 you know, loan, as is the case in uh, Montenegro, or whereas uh, the country uh, might be increasingly in a situation where it's becoming a significant employer, as it is the case in, in, in Serbia, in very important sectors. Uh, but the country really is now on the cusp of, uh, of attaining uh, real leverage. Uh, of course, quite how, in what way, in what manner, and to what purposes uh, this uh, leverage will be employed is, is an entirely different an entirely different. Um, uh, question. Uh, the second really significant wider trend that I, I that I've tried to describe in the in the paper is the the emerging ecosystem of uh, interested actors. So, in other words, we are now getting to a situation where in where in most of these countries, one is able to identify a rising number of local actors that do share an interest in long-term cooperation with different, with China and with different Chinese uh, institutions. Of course, of course, they would vary from country to country, uh, but maybe just in a very schematic uh, manner, uh, there are at least three pillars to these emerging uh, um, constituencies of interest. The first one is one what one might describe kind of legacy uh, relationships going back to the old days, uh, of course, we do know, and you know, from from recent political history, that China did have some presence uh, at some of these relationships. Although they are kind of gradually being supplanted, they do still matter at the individual level, sometimes at the institutional level. So these kinds of legacy relationships are one one component. A second component of this constituency is what one might call positional contacts. Uh, you know, these would be people, you know, within an interests, within institutions uh, that have a very pragmatic uh, approach, a very pragmatic interest in developing cooperation uh, with, China, with China, whether this is in the shape of uh, different projects, investments, uh, wider sectoral frameworks, uh, and all the rest of it. Uh, but, but clearly, this is a major, a major now uh, pillar of uh, individuals and uh, 
institutions that are, you know, that, that do have a long-term interest in cooperating with China. And the third pillar is what I kind of call new actors um, that do have, again, uh, a rising in interest in cooperating with different Chinese institutions. Uh, and the, the array of actors here is quite significant, you know, ranging from, you know, returning students, private universities, businesses, media uh, organizations, and, uh, and, you know, it is, it is very, very clear uh, that we have a rising number of, uh, of actors, specifically in this domain, uh, that are more and more involved in, in you know, in trying to uh, develop relationships with China. So, for instance, one indicator of that would be the multiple, uh, you know, the mushrooming of business uh, organizations which are interested in, in working with, uh, with China. Uh, I mean, it's quite difficult, diff it's quite it's quite difficult to map out actually all you know, the entire range of such organizations, but in many countries, you know, there are five or six already, not just in the Western Balkans, but beyond. I mean, you know, in my own country, uh, there are five or six that I can, that I can think of just, just off the top of, my, uh, top of my head. And two last points to finish on. Um, one is that, uh, you know, with this rising presence and, and, and with this sort of deeper penetration into the economies, societies of the Western Balkan countries, one could say that there is a kind of emerging logic of inevitable engagement. Uh, in other words, there are consequences to these already quite significant uh, initial uh, engagements. Uh, you know, when, you know, for instance, when you provide loans, you know, a whole range of issues begin to emerge down the road. If there is an issue with these loans, uh, if you make an investment, especially if it's a uh, long-term investment, uh, all of a sudden, at some point, different issues of labor standards, environmental standards, are, are going to are going to um, are going to be, you know, need to be addressed, and all the rest of it. Uh, so again, we are moving into a new situation uh, whereby China, in a way, is losing. Uh, the comfort of being able to make these moves and being able to make these, uh, to develop these relationships and will be increasingly having to address and respond to the different consequences from its initial acts of engagement in the region. And I think this, is, this will be really important to follow in the coming uh, in the coming in the coming years, and the final point on which I want to end is that uh, China, in a way, is now a revealed power uh, in the region, increasingly in a revealed power in the region, uh, in the sense that uh, for a very long time uh, it you know it held up the power of promise, it had you know it held the power of expectation, um, it was uh, it was. Uh, you know, quite invisible in a lot of its uh, endeavors, in a lot of its uh, activities. Uh, and of course, as we, as we all know, uh, this is changing. It's changing, rather, it's changing rather quickly. A lot of actors are beginning to respond uh, to, China's, uh, to China's presence. Uh, and I think, again, this is going to be a very interesting dynamic because societies, and especially political elites, are increasingly going to have to respond uh, to the revealed power of, uh, of, uh, of China, uh, whether they are pleased in some cases to find themselves in uh, where they are on the on the verge of becoming uh, almost uh, dependent when it comes to fiscal policy, to economic uh, policy, and all the rest of it. Um, so let me let me stop let me stop here. I don't want to you know speak for too long. Uh, but I'm sure during the Q&A and during the uh, discussions, I, you know, I, I will be able to share some more specific examples as well. Because the, I mean, the, my idea, my initial idea was to kind of give a sort of more, more of an overview, uh, rather than dwell too much on specific, uh, on specific cases.
Thank you Thanks. very much, Vlado, for this brilliant Thanks. overview and also for providing us with a few terms that we can go back to the power of promise, the promise of expectation, mm. and maybe the question of uh, that this whether this promise is to provide a kind of ample opportunities for powerful disappointments as well at some point. Sure. But let's turn to one of the countries where the power of promise is still very much alive, if we can put it like that. Stefan, what does the situation look like in Belgrade at the moment? Well, it, it's quite sunny as well, like in Berlin, but uh, yeah, it's not that warm, but it's quite sunny. <laughs> uh, well, first of all, I would like to thank you for uh, having me today here. Uh, I had the opportunity to speak with Vladimir while he was visiting uh, Serbia, and I really admired the approach that was taken. And uh, now seeing the results, I understand why it was tested like that. But. Uh, I, I, listening to him now, I'm thinking that I would, I would really not like to be in his shoes and in his place because identifying trends in the Western Balkans and speaking about Chinese presence in the Western Balkans is quite a difficult task to do. Uh, Chinese approach in the Western Balkans, in addition to everything that Vladimir already said, can be also uh, explained like a multi-tier approach because not all of the countries in the western balkans have the same level of cooperation uh if we look at the western balkans as a gathering of six countries that are on the path to join the eu in considerable future uh, we can move one of them i mean kosovo um, from the start because china and kosovo do not have diplomatic relationship at all uh, albania and north macedonia do have a certain level of cooperation that is well, very well described in the Vladimir's uh, article, but it's still not even close to the level of some other Western Balkan countries. There, then we have Montenegro as a country that is often and repeatedly being used as a bad example of Chinese influence and Chinese presence in one European country. But to be completely honest, that, that's something that uh, uh, is uh, not uh, rule. It is something that has been an exception more than a rule for the Western Balkan countries or to look at the wider region for the Central and Eastern European countries. And then you have Bosnia and uh, Herzegovina and Serbia, countries uh, where Chinese presence is uh, really, really um, on the different level than the other four countries. And even among those two countries, one is uh, quite ahead and there is uh, that is the spot where I step in I, I, I say whenever something happens in Western Balkans regarding China I become quite popular uh, guy among the different experts in different outlets and uh, I understand why but um, as Vladimir said uh, it is something that has been uh, in the focus of uh, every one of us here probably and uh, since a couple of years ago uh, I had the opportunity and pleasure to meet Yanka at the Belgrade Security Forum in 2018, and I was at that time just starting to, to dive into the topic more intensively. And uh, honest to God, there was like three articles and publications about the Chinese presence in the Western Balkans, not counting some academia articles and academia, academia work. So the interest has skyrocketed, skyrocketed since then. But I really think that. Uh, what we are still uh, lacking is the understanding of the region. A uh, publication like this is a step closer to the deeper understanding. Just last night, the uh, N1 Serbian tele cable television news network uh, uh, showed the Deutsche Welle produced um, documentary movie about the Chinese presence in the Serbia, Bosnia and Herzegovina and Hungary as a third country. And uh, for me, the most important sentence in the whole 45-minute movie was, uh, was the, this one. Uh, the journalist spoke with the uh, local official from Tuzla, from Lukavac municipality. And uh, the local official said, um, actually the local expert said that uh, they spoke with the Chinese ambassador in Bosnia. And they asked him, why are you giving uh, Bosnian official loans for a uh, coal power power plant and uh, why are you investing in a dirt technology, not in a clean technology? And the answer was simple. Uh, the Chinese ambassador told that independent expert, uh, he told him, well, your officials came to us and asked us for the financing of the project for the coal power power plant. 
and they have not asked us for the projects regarding uh, renewable energy. And if they ask us to do that, uh, we would be more than happy to provide loans for that. And that, for me, uh, really nice explains uh, um, what is actually the nature of real the relationship. Chinese outreach is not uh, something dedicated solely to the Western Balkans. China is trying to position itself as a global power, as a global leader in many, many spheres. And uh, Belt and Road Initiative is just one of the aspects of that. The Western Balkans uh, has been uh, a case study because it was so assertive and so acceptive of that Chinese outreach, especially in Serbia. Uh, speaking about multi-tier, uh, multi-entering multi -entering point, Serbia is actually the poster child of cooperation in that sense uh, when it comes to China. Uh, from the start, it was not solely based on the economic and infrastructural cooperation. From the start, we have witnessed the cooperation, the political cooperation, the bilateral, um, the bilateral visits as well. But now we are speaking about province to province cooperation. Vojvodina is cooperating with the Chinese provinces. City of Belgrade is cooperating with the Chinese provinces. In Bosnia and Herzegovina, Republika Srpska is cooperating with the Chinese provinces. We have the promoters of uh, Chinese presence in the Western Balkans, and to be more precise, in Serbia as well. Uh, if you listen to one of the uh, Alexander Vucic's interviews and uh, one of the uh, presentations over the past 12 months, you will see that they do not need their own propaganda. China doesn't need their, its own propaganda in the Western Balkans, or to be more precise, in Serbia, because Western Balkan leaders are doing that for them. Uh, there is no stronger message for the people, uh, citizens of the Western Balkans, when the most popular leader in the region goes to the airport, welcomes the airplane, and kisses the Chinese flag. There is no stronger message that can be sent. So uh, I, uh, I am fully aware that uh, this is discussion that will be more, uh, more detailed in the future. Uh, the last three years have been the launching pad of the interest, especially uh, among the Western community for the topic. Uh, and uh, I uh, want to repeat that I truly believe that this publication is one step closer to the better understanding. Um, and that is because it has not asked uh, why is China bad for the region? Because 90% of the uh, publications and research come to, come to this region and uh, are asking question, why is China bad? Uh, and uh, they, are, uh, they are not asking if China is bad for the region. This is one comprehensive overview, a good starting point, uh, a good um, stock taking for, for this moment. And from, from, the, from here, we can now have a constructive and more uh, informative debate about this. And I would be happy to contribute to this debate in the next 45 or 50 minutes and, of course, to continue conversation even after. Thank you very much, Stefan. And I think you have stressed one, we've stressed many important points, but one that I would like to focus on from my being a China researcher myself perspective, um, the amount of the demand for this kind of information, the demand for tracking and tracing what is actually happening on the ground is enormous. And the relatively small gang of China watchers in Europe in general is hardly able to absorb all of that demand at the moment. So I do think there's a huge degree of the huge necessity for just building out uh, greater expertise. And I think we, we should be very grateful for people like you and Vlado who are taking on these tasks um, in countries where there's really a very thin layer of people that can do this research and can do this research well and that engage with, with in, in all of these research questions. So um, so that's, I think you're absolutely right in terms of pointing out how just in the last two years, this entire field has exploded to a degree that makes it not only hard for the expert community, but also for policymakers to sort of keep up with what's going on and to not remain in these kind of commonsensical, um, stereotypical phrases within which we would like to describe the world to make just make things a tiny bit easier for us uh, under the current circumstances. Um, I would like to go into a couple of topics more deeply, but I see that uh, Ardian Hackett has already raised his hand and I would like to bring him into the conversation. But after that, we will talk a little bit about sub-state level uh, and what is going on there. Uh, but Ard Mr. Ardian Hackett, I would like to bring you in right here. You're still muted, so maybe just... Perfect. Thank you very much, Angela, uh, for bringing me in. Actually, I 
I heard in uh, previous presentation something that made me just click, and uh, it was this uh, demand from the Bosnian authorities uh, to the Chinese counterparts to get a coal uh, to get a coal plant. And basically, uh, this is something that we have found into uh, during our research is that uh, while in the dominant discourse you have always a predatory China, so to say, quoting, coming into the Balkans and uh, uh, using the weak and unprotected uh, Balkan elites, well, 99.9% .9 of the time is the contrary. It's the Balkan politicians who go to China to ask for projects that may or may not uh, be the priority of their countries. I just, I, I'll probably from this introdu introduction to just uh, take a couple of minutes and underline some points that I found in uh, the excellent paper of Mr. Schopel, and also some findings uh, that we have also met in our uh, everyday work with connectivity. Uh, we work in, I work for Cooperation Development Institute in Tirana. We organize Tirana Connectivity Forum every year, every fall. And when you deal with connectivity, it's impossible not to deal with China. And uh, basically, we're very happy that we met China somehow in our road, because for us, to keep it short, it's uh, very valuable to identify what are our own problems in the Western Balkans, and second, to, def to, to define or to identify the problems that the EU approach has when dealing with the Western Balkans. So, uh, Staying into the connectivity projects, we, what we have identified is that almost all the problems, they belong to the host country. I will start with the project identification. So basically who identified which road or which energy, etc., etc. As it was mentioned before, it's, uh, it's the host country. It's the Balkan country who says, I want you to invest or to get engaged in uh, what we have identified as well is that the feasibility study or technical papers in 90%, 99% of the cases are prepared by Western companies. So we cannot say that the technical standards were wrong or were badly prepared by the Chinese counterparts. Um, we found that in all the cases, in all the corruption allegations, there are local Western Balkan politicians that are involved. And we didn't find any corruption case against the Chinese. Maybe we have overseen some, but we didn't find any. Uh, we didn't find so any uh, proven corruption on the course. And what we found is that the cheapest loans, the cheapest loans were provided by China. Uh, however, uh, the funniest thing is that we found that those same problems were faced also by Western companies. Uh, we will bring this in another, I mean, the publication that is coming, but in the case of a Western company, which I will not mention the name, in a uh, Western Balkan country, we found that the increase in the public debt taken because of this Western company was 10 times the amount, the initial amount. Well, it was local debt, local government debt, but still 10 times more. The, the local government is almost bankrupt. There were delays. There were false invoices thus to subcontractors, there were expropriation problems, conflict of interest, and faulty normative procedures. To re re recapitulate, uh, I believe that instead of uh, hitting uh, at China involvement in the Western Balkans, I mean, God knows they are not perfect, we should focus on the fact of uh, why the Chinese behave like this. Or why the West? I mean, what are our problems? And there are two problems that we have identified. The first one is the capture of the institutions from our corrupt political elites. And the second is the incompetence of our institutions. And once we identify those problems, we realize that they are shared from our Western partners, Germany, France, whatever, Luxembourg, Austrian companies, you name it, and the Chinese ones, Indian, and also by uh, the Chinese ones. And the second one is the incompetence. Too close. Uh, it's a great research because it goes beyond the normal mainstream uh, talk like Chinese are coming to the Western Balkans with their corrupt behavior and brings people and institutions and policy making. This is great. We love it. 
the second one is what I found is that the language is uh, constructive. It's not uh, overcharged with, uh, let's say, ideology, which is very rare when you talk about China. Uh, third, it, um, it focuses on our own problems. My problem is not China, I don't care. It's not the German, Austrian, French companies. I don't care for them. They have much better managers than I, myself. I care about my own problems. And this uh, analysis helps us do this. And last, it, by focusing on, uh, and I'm quoting, leverage on policy choices, it brings us to the possibility that we have to have some leverage. Here I will bring an example. Uh, during the preparation of the conclusions of the Budapest guidelines in 2017, the Operation and Development Institute worked together with our Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And we managed to make the cooperation of China with WBIF in the final document. So it was possible. That's all, thank you. Thank you very much. And I think it's, it's, it's good to get all, as many voices from the region as possible in this conversation because, indeed, we don't have these conversations often enough. I also find it very important that you stress the fact of agency here. And I would like to throw that uh, back to both of our speakers, Vlado and Stefan. Um, you know, this, often this conversation is about, as, as uh, Mr. Hakusha says, you know, what are the Chinese doing to the region? What are the Europeans doing to the region? As if the countries in the region were not really deciding about this or actually even exploiting and playing on it as I think we can see in the Serbian case quite a bit. Um, Vlado, what have you found in your research? Um, how much of agency is there? Is there an awareness among all of the countries or among some of the countries or among some of the actors within the countries how large their agency, their leverage is in the respective um, relationship and how that can also be used maybe um, for the relationship with Europe or other players. Mm. Well, actually, if I can start by responding to the very last bit of your question first, uh, because this is actually quite difficult to find out uh, in the sense that uh, I have found officials quite cagey about discussing these issues. In fact, it was it has been quite difficult to obtain meetings uh, with with many uh, you know with many of the institutions in the uh, in the region and when you do talk with people from the uh, institutions i have to admit that one gets a very kind of formal uh, by the book uh, uh, responses that really actually uh, make it quite difficult to to reach the types of the types of conclusions that uh, that you're asking me about so so if i if i have to respond in a kind of uh, strict analytical sense i would i would say that i cannot really answer your question on the basis of this current of this current research but of, of course we do have some answers that relate to your question you know beyond this uh, research and uh, of course there is an obvious context uh, to this and of course I did not really think it necessary to include that in my uh, in my introduction yes geopolitical ambivalence is a huge issue yes there is an incredible developmental gap which is you know insufficiently addressed and and, and you know we can talk along you know we can talk a lot about we can talk a lot about that um, but what what I do find quite interesting in the region, and I think this is, uh, this is something that we should be really more focused on, uh, is the actual interaction when priorities in bilateral cooperation are discussed and, and when they're actually transformed into specific projects. Because I think this is quite under underappreciated, and I think this is also the terrain where a lot of the challenges and the problems uh, interacting with China actually begin to emerge. And I, I would also say that this is most vividly the space where the discrepancies between the Chinese model of doing things and the European model of doing uh, things actually begin to clash. And let me give you a couple of examples. Yes, of course, I mean, I'm also, I mean, I've been in public administrations and I, and I can also, of course, share instances where, you know, the Chinese have been sufficiently accommodating when it comes to, 
you know, formalizing documents, deciding on priorities and all the rest of it. But once you move beyond that stage, um, we have to be aware that practices and ways of doing things uh, are actually embodied values. And I know this sounds uh, abstract, and let me, let me give you specific examples to illustrate what I, what I mean by that. Uh, and if I have to so, sort of briefly focus on the question of Montenegro and uh, you know, the, the highway construction uh, project uh, that gets discussed a lot. Yes, a, a, lot of, uh, a lot of the writing and a lot of the analysis and a lot of the discussion on the political implications of this project you know, relate to whether there's a debt trap or not, whether there were previous instances under which or previous institutions, uh, um, you know, with which this project could have been could have been found uh, could have been funded. But as far as I'm concerned, this is actually this is only half the story. Uh, the story is in the actual relationship, as it is embodied in this project. The fact that you have a that you have a contract, uh, parts of which have been have not even been disclosed to members of the Montenegrin uh, parliament, uh, certain financial components that have been disclosed, certainly not publicly. The fact that, uh, that there are jurisdictional uh, issues, the fact that the contract is sel itself uh, was, was signed uh, on, you know, on, in the t on the territory of the Chinese uh, uh, embassy, the fact that they are very specific and quite serious uh, provisions in the contract which, uh, which entail that in instances of uh, non-compliance or non-payment or delayed payment and all the rest of it, uh, Chinese, you know, the Chinese side might be in position to acquire certain assets. Now, so when we discuss particular projects, when we discuss certainly instances, I would, I would claim that you know, we, we don't simply need to focus on some of the important dimensions, you know, the, you know, the rate of lending, whether there were other actors, whether there were other institutions. But I would, I would insist that we looked at this in a more, well, in a more kind of rounded manner, uh, because you know, these are certain practices, these are certain ways of doing things which the Chinese bring to the table that have been formalized in contracts that have you know, significant, significant implications, not just political. So, and, and this is, so from this sense, this is, it's not simply a project. It's not simply a practice of building something. It is actually a set of embodied values, a set, a set of certain ways of doing things which you know, are quite contradictory uh, you know, if we analyze them in the context of the wider political effort of all of these, uh, of all of these countries uh, to move in a certain, in a certain direction, you know, towards certain standards, towards uh, different ways of doing things. Uh, so, so ju you know, just, ju just, to, just to recap, yes, of course, there is agency in this instance, uh, and yes, of course, we do have a lot of instances where clearly local political agents you know, have chosen to enter coalitions of convenience uh, with the Chinese under which this wider effort of, you know, dare I say, Europeanization is actually going to be made more difficult. And I, I think this is really the cross, you know, the, the sort of the key, uh, you know, the, from my point of view, the, the key sort of issue when we discuss uh, uh, these, uh, these relationships. And again, I, I really didn't, you know, didn't want to go in my introduction in some of the obvious uh, sort of features of the current overall political and geopolitical uh, situation because I think this is quite self-evident to this particular, to this particular, uh, to this particular audience. But of course, you know, we, I'm, I'm happy to do that. And, and Stefan, if you if you hear what Vlado says right now in terms of agency and agency that exists, 
Would you agree that there's always enough knowledge, though, um, in terms of what one is oneself getting into? Um, because that's one of the questions that if we do draw a couple of regional comparisons that we see in the Asia-Pacific region quite a bit, um, that there is a large degree of agency, um, especially when it comes to big infrastructure projects, um, and there is a lot of wanting this from the political side, but not always is there an actual understanding of the substance of the contract, of the consequences of kind of the long-term implications. Would you say that's not the case for the region? We're actually pretty clear-eyed about what's going on. Po uh, policymakers here know what they're doing and know what they're getting themselves into. Um, what would be your assessment there? Well, there are many adjectives that I could use to describe I would say most of the governments uh, within the Western Balkans, but I will, I will focus on Serbian one. Um, and that is the uh, opportunistic. And um, in 2009, when Serbia signed the first strategic agreement with China, that was a good opportunity to um, expand then set policy of neutrality caused by the necessity to position Serbia in the field of international relationship uh, relations uh, like that because of the whole Kosovo issue and the fact that Serbia was some, something on a crossroad of uh, further Europeanization or spreading its wings across the globe. And uh, since that agreement, Serbia has used, the Serbian government and Serbian officials have used every opportunity to take what was offered to them and to propose a lot of things that are needed by Serbia. I would just put it in a simple examples of two factories now um, highly re recognized as a harmful effect of Chinese investment in the Western Balkans. And those factories are uh, still milling in Smederevo and mines in Bor. Um, it was those factories and those projects are seen as a harmful Chinese presence and impact on in environmental situation in Serbia. And now uh, we are speaking about uh, uh, two um, factories that are the biggest pollution producers inside of the country. And both of those countries were under management for the uh, government of Serbia prior to being sold because they are foreign direct investment to China. And Serbian government didn't know what to do with it, uh, didn't know how to manage it to become successful, didn't know which partner to find. I would remind you that, especially in Smedrevo, for the 10 years, it was U.S. Steel, the USA company, that was part owner of the, of the uh, mill before giving it back to, uh, to government of Serbia. And they needed the opportunity. Uh, the Serbian government needed the opportunity to keep five, six, seven thousand workplaces of each of those factories. It needed the opportunity to continue to produce to that export product that is significant export product in Serbian scale. And there wasn't many interested parties at that time. And the opportunity occurred to do that in partnership with China. So for me, that is a good example, good case of the opportunistic agency on Serbian side. Um, regarding information, regarding knowledge, uh, I, I, I truly hope that people who are part of the Serbian government know how to read and know how to compare numbers in Serbian budget and in Serbian uh, loans that are taken from China. Uh, so far, and as of my knowledge as well, we are not in any kind of a danger. We are quite well tucked uh, within the, our borders or when it comes to the budgetary borders and the perspective of it. Whether they are aware that if you give 30 year old so socialist industrial minds to the Chinese company, whether they are aware that uh, it will cause the environmental har harmless, yes, probably they are, but still they are using the opportunity to uh, keep their reputation and to keep five, six, seven thousand workplaces more than they are uh, keen to keep the environmental situation as it is right now. Again, um, if, if that is something that, uh, that can be described as informative, I think that they are quite informative. I, I, and, uh, I'm not, and I'm pretty sure that they are not stupid. They are quite aware what they are doing. How good or bad is it? That is something that we are discussing and that should be discussed but potentially it is something that will benefit them short term while the consequences are coming in the long term. And as basic political stance is 
don't worry what is a long term consequence for you about the short term. Tanya, uh, Tanya Gamma, I would like to bring you in here, uh, if you like, and, uh, and after that, I have another question for, for Stefan and Vlado. Tanya, please. All right, thank you. Um, of course, obviously, these are all um, very, very important points that have been uh, raised so far. I would like to uh, comment on the need of more information and more knowledge and understanding of, of China as a global actor as well. And I totally agree with uh, some of the analysis that has been previously made. And I was just thinking that perhaps it uh, might be useful to look up uh, China's experience and um, uh, presence in other regions in the world to be better informed, to build up better understanding. Um, if we want to build up capacity and um, have people who are fully aware and we can rely on more uh, better understanding then maybe we should look up what uh, has happened in africa uh, southeast asia and other regions in the world not that we necessarily need to draw comparisons but this might be very informative in terms of uh, being better prepared when we choose how to partner with china because we obviously and definitely are going to be partnering with china Thank you. Thank you much. And I think, uh, Vlado, have you, um, in your fact-finding operation, when talking to people on the ground, have you found um, a lot of people talking to you about the kind of perspectives that they have compared, looked at um, how has their relationship kind of to China, how is it seen in other places? And maybe to add also to that question a little twist, um, there is a change in the perception of China in many regions of the world ongoing at the moment, including in Europe, but also in a number of African countries, in a range of Asian countries, even in like good friends such as Pakistan, there's a change in terms of how investments and how the relationship is being perceived. Um, do you think there is a trend also in the Western Balkans or are we still on that uptick or is that also a change in the perceptions, especially among the public, um, emerging in terms of how the relationship in the future could be structured, like. Hmm. Well, uh, I haven't, I haven't really been able to see much public opinion. They, I mean, I know, I know there are a couple of couple of surveys and uh, uh, which do actually focus on China gradually. If I have to put it succinctly, getting on the radar of public attention. Uh, but I, I think this is probably as far as we have gotten uh, from a kind of wider perspective, wider societal perspective. Uh, at the same time, I, my, my kind of intuition and on the basis of, uh, of, of this particular uh, research, there are a couple of related points which, which I didn't really include in the, in the report because there wasn't sufficient space, but which might answer your question. Um, I, I see that this kind of power of promise still holds uh, in the sense that uh, because of the incredibly difficult overall geopolitical situation in which the countries of the region continue to find themselves in the sense of, you know, lack of clear perspective. Uh, and we often very, you know, I mean, you know, often we use this term in very kind of foreign policy macro political terms but this has this has a very personal dimension to people uh, and this kind of geopolitical limbo um, if anything lends more credence to this power of promise which i still think holds uh, a because there is not so much information generally about china b because there is not so much information about what potentially is not working in these types of relationships between China and their own countries, um, uh, and see because that's not that's not really changing enormously in the sense that uh, most people in the region continue to see uh, the presence, uh, you know, the image of China via, you know, in those days between the clash with the. Uh, with the United States, but of course also through the wider narrative of the rise of the East and all the rest of it. And although among experts this is increasingly 
very much a qualified statement or a very much a qualified trend, uh, I, would, I would say that this is not the case among the wider public, and that's quite understandable. At the same time, you do increasingly get uh, the impression that in certain localities where there are now issues with China's uh, involvement, so for instance in certain parts of Bosnia, you know, around Tuzla, uh, um, you know, in Serbia, in Smederevo and Bor, you know, there is, there is rising discontent in civil, uh, civil activity at the, local, at the local level. But for different reasons, this has not really matured into, the, into a wider sort of public uh, perception. So, so there is this kind of trend as well. Um, but given the fact that governments, incumbents, have an incredible incentive in projecting a certain kind of image of this relationship, of the pluses and minuses of this relationship. Given also the state of the media in most of these countries, um, I would expect that it will take a pretty significant event, sort of macro event, to really begin to shift why the public, uh, public attitudes or it would, it would take a major mistake by the Chinese. Uh, so, you know, for instance, in the case of Montenegro, they pushed the country too hard in terms of repaying of the loan, etc., etc., which, of course, we cannot exclude. But again, given what China is doing in other regions, I would not really expect them to make this type of mistake, specifically in the case of, of Montenegro. And one final point on, on this, um, and again, this is mostly coming um, from, you know, from the field work that I, that I did. Uh, and it does have relevance, I think, in the sort of sub-political attitudes and sub-political levels of the uh, of, uh, attitudes to China. And it has to do with, you know, uh, what I would call the kind of a certain transactional disposition. And what do I mean by that? Um, you know, we know that in foreign policy circles there's been a lot of discussion, particularly in the case of uh, Serbia, of this kind of multi-vector uh, foreign policy. You know, the fact that you're playing countries off each other and you're kind of preserving, you're sort of constantly hedging and trying to, you know, trying to get different actors to do, you know, to do certain things for you and all the rest of it. Um, and we describe it as a sort of transactional attitude. Well, my concern is that uh, if, we, if these countries, if these societies continue, and these economies, if they continue to operate in this sort of a limbo for a, for, you know, for a prolonged period of time yet, uh, if we do not see a much more pronounced trend toward, toward their gradual inclusion and integration um, you know, not just, not just in terms of institutions, but also in terms of, you know, real integration in terms of economy and all the rest of it. You know, there is a danger of a sort of, you know, of the embedding of this kind of uh, almost everyday transactional disposition, uh, that you're basically continuously finding yourself in a situation where you simply, you know, you, you simply have to find uh, you're under a great deal of pressure to find solutions, you know, regardless of the direction in which you, in, in which you seek such, uh, such uh, solutions. Uh, so I, I think this is, this is the real danger down the road, that we do find ourselves uh, in a situation where, again, and I'm, I'm speaking here mainly about the non-political aspect. You know, I'm... I'm, I'm I'm speaking about companies, different institutions, just different actors, different individuals who are, you, you know, who are constantly having to respond to a situation where they have to seek opportunities, where they have to seek opportunities for development, for, uh, you know, for investment and all, and, and all the rest of it. And if, and if this kind of limbo persists, then China is going to have a lot of leeway and it will simply, it will, it will remain and it will, it will consolidate uh, its, uh, its position 
uh, of an actor that is able to provide uh, such uh, incentives and such opportunities, you know, regardless of uh, whatever types of issues and problems and uh, you know uh, queries we we might we might we might have. I mean, this is this is the wider concern that that I have. To bring in Vesela and Dario here, and I would like to clarify with Tanya whether that is a newly raised hand or whether that is the uh, hand that was raised from before. Okay, that was a ra raised hand from before. So uh, Vesela and then Dario, we'll take those two together. Thank you very much. Uh, a very quickly questions to both uh, Vlado and Stefan. Um, Vlado, when uh, when I saw your research, I remember I was really struck by this civil society part of it and the fact that because we usually think about the Chinese as not really capable of doing that type of thing. So maybe if you can give us one example, that would be great as an illustration because uh, I think this is very a very significant finding of yours. Um, and then to the two of you, what do you think the EU should do? Uh, and will do uh, with China in the, in the Balkans, because uh, obviously there is uh, uh, tension uh, on the on the uh, kind of transatlantic front. What one will decide to do? Uh, in which way uh, would one t want to take sides? How will that look like in the region, and especially with things that the, that obviously affect the EU immediately. Uh, Stefan talked about uh, uh, power plants. I mean, the Green Deal is something that the EU will have to grapple with. Uh, do you think one should really look for a partnership here uh, with China in order to make the Green Deal happen? Uh, how do you think this could play out? Thank you, Vesela, and I think it's, it's great that you differentiate between what the EU should do and what it will do. I think that's always a, a good question. Dario, please. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thanks for having me here today, and thank and congrats to Vlado and other people involved in this very very interesting uh, paper. I would just like to briefly build uh, on what uh, Vlado already mentioned: the fact that sometimes there is, I mean, the assumption that local elites or local stakeholders are completely passive when it comes to Chinese uh, intervention or pool in their country is uh, not entirely true. Uh, and I could mention, there's a still small examples, of course, but I think they're quite interesting. Uh, for instance, when it comes to, uh, to the country where I'm based in Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, there were lately two interesting episodes when some local uh, political actors actually react in a way against uh, China somehow. And this was the case where um, uh, Bosnia, for instance, aligned on a, uh, a European Union or CFSP decision when it comes to um, cyber attacks uh, coming from Russian and Chinese entities. Um, and the list of person and entities were subject to restrictive measures and Bosnia aligned to this, uh, to this decision. Actually, it's a, it's a decision which amended the previous decision with the same content somehow. But anyway, both they aligned to both. And one more, in a way, more interesting in a way is when uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina adopted um, an initiative by Germany, uh, the UN, last October, and condemning, condemning any treatment of Uyghurs and ongoing situation in, uh, in Hong Kong and Tibet. And that was pretty interesting because actually Bosnia and Herzegovina decided to jump in. It was a bit of a, usually when it comes to these um, issues, there's always a tendency from Bosnia to um, abstain, mostly because of the lack of internal consensus on these issues, which proved to be very, very divisive. If you look at them in from an internal political perspective in, in Bosnia and Herzegovina. I think these are interesting. We should not, of course, um, um, overestimate them because they're also linked to the internal rifts. The fact that currently uh, Bosnian, I mean, that the two uh, main holders of uh, Bosnian foreign policy tools are in two different, in the hands of two different constituencies. Now, the foreign ministry is led by a 
Bosniak uh, political stakeholder, while of course the presidency, which is the other um, actor when it comes to Bosnian foreign policy, there is of course there are all three constituent constituent people are represented. So some of this is um, um, this rift is somehow linked also to the internal rift between the two parties, the parties representing right now Bosniak and the party representing right now Serbs. Uh, but it's interesting because it's the first time uh, that, 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 that Bosnia was outspoken. Of course, it comes down to Muslim um, solidarity in a way, of course, between Bosniak and what's happening with the Uyghurs. But I think it's interesting. I'm not sure it's gonna have major repercussion. Um, of course, China condemned, condemns harshly uh, the position by the Bosnian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. I don't think we will see any um, stronger follow-up to this, uh, nor in, the, in terms, not, nor politically, nor neither politically nor uh, in terms of civil society. But I think it's still a point to be to be considered also for the future. Thanks. Very much, uh, and I would like to go in reverse order now with uh, start starting with Stefan. Uh, to uh, maybe address particularly the question what the EU should or should not do, uh, and then uh, give it back to Vlado as well in terms of the civil society aspect, uh, and also how much domestic politics actually is uh, a part of, of China policy in general. Uh, Stefan. Uh, thank you, Anka, and uh, thank to both uh, Dario and uh, Vesela for the questions. Well, uh, I was thinking about the answer and uh, the, the first sentence that came to my mind was that EU should pull it together. Uh, it should uh, make something, uh, let me rephrase it. Uh, the way that EU has been handling the COVID crisis over the past 12 months when it comes to the Western Balkans was borderline catastrophic. Uh, the way uh, that EU has approached uh, generally the mitigation process and generally the, the, the partnership uh, level with the Western Balkan countries, each country separately was uh, something that is uh, un, was unimaginable that it can be as bad as it was. Uh, mentioning the previous work and mentioning the financial um, uh, aspects of cooperation is one thing, but I just asked a, a, a friend of mine, I asked a couple of days ago, would you like more to uh, receive $1 billion or 1 million vaccines? So that is just a question at this point, which one would you like more? Without the, and the, the fact that it has da uh, damaged its own image so much within the region over the past 12 months is something that will have to be worked on quite extensively and intensively in the future uh, for, for, for EU to, to gain the legitimacy that it had uh, prior to prior to COVID-19 crisis. In addition to that, um, in the pre-election campaign in 2020, the EPP openly stand behind uh, Alexander Vucic during the pre-election campaign. So that was a clear stance that EU is still supporting, not the EU, but the strongest political party within the EU system is still openly supporting the, 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 the ruling governing uh, majority uh, in, in, in the framework of a Serbian political ecosystem. So uh, for me, the first advice, the free advice to the EU is pull it together, uh, make a clear stand because the, the, the cacophony of voices coming from the European Parliament and from European Commission is one thing. And this goes, this goes for many other aspects, but it includes the, the China cooperation as well. Uh, because the cooperation with China is something that we are hearing Latin criticism coming from Brussels and Latin criticism coming from the Western Europe, but uh, then there is no open uh, mentioning of the criticism in the European Commission report. Uh, we uh, hear that uh, there is a, a little, uh, something that, uh, that, that has been uh, outlined in Serbian media is that uh, EU is criticizing Serbia for cooperation with China, and then they sign a strategic uh, comprehensive agreement on investments. You have to explain then to the broader Serbian public what is comprehensive agreement and that it's not signed, that it's agreed, et cetera, et cetera. But right now, uh, when it comes to especially Serbia, uh, to, uh, EU is uh, as, it, uh, as is its lowest in, during the past decade. 
the future is unclear. What happened with North Macedonia is uh, was immensely harmful as well. Uh, the, uh, the new methodology so far uh, has not been implemented and it, it is not working. So I don't know if uh, we need a hard reset or a re-examination of the current state of relation relationship. But uh, what the approach over the past few months has degraded the position of the EU within Serbia, and I believe within the broad region of the Western Balkans as well, immensely. So yeah. That was very honest and very brutal, and I think that's sometimes the right way to go about it, to have the conversation. Uh, Vlado, if you mm -hmm. allow that I would bring uh, Leila Bikacic. I'm, I've been calling you by your first name just because I'm butchering <laughs> everyone's last name, so I'm super sorry about this. I would like to bring you in as well, um, to then for Vlado to have a round, because I have one final question for the two as well. Uh, thank you, and no problem with the last name. It's kind of a, a, a language, uh, I don't know, a language game, I would say, that uh, proves that you are very proficient with, uh, with the Slavic languages, uh, eventually when you, can, uh, when you can pronounce my last name, so no problems. Um, pretty much my, my, my question was, was uh, answered in, in Stefan's uh, last intervention. I was uh, basically uh, interested in, um, in this context of uh, a new geopolitical uh, position of power uh, in the Western Balkan, particularly in the context of the of the COVID, which which was already uh, already uh, asked and, and and responded. But um, I'm coming from Bosnia and Herzegovina, and it was uh, an interesting position uh, hearing about Darius' intervention and. Uh, painting basically a uh, Bosnian position as a positive one, which is a very unusual situation because usually Bosnia situation is, is uh, viewed negatively, and it is. So I wouldn't necessarily give too much attention to these two decorative uh, positions of, of Bosnia and Herzegovina in the context of China because everything else related to China is outright positive. Uh, here and we don't have a ver very much uh, critical uh, standing point on either side, including the civil society. Civil society, unfortunately, is not uh, considering China's influence aside from the anecdotal and mostly international interventions when it comes to the China's uh, influence. Uh, China's um, investments are viewed uh, very positively. Uh, they are actually presented as an employment opportunity, uh, completely wrongfully. And um, basically, we don't have uh, a clear picture of what exactly the country has promised uh, to Chinese in return to the, to the investment. So we are currently, the uh, Chinese are involved in uh, all of the uh, major infrastructural uh, agreements, uh, including the energy sector, which is becoming very problematic because of the, it's jeopardizing the position of Bosnia in the energy community. And uh, they are, they are uh, getting involved in the um, highway, the 5C corridor, which is funded by the EBRD. We have a problem with, uh, with, with, the, with, the, uh, with basically uh, lack of uh, proper research when it comes to the, to the, to the real interests of the, of the Chinese. And unless the EU uh, doesn't take any, any uh, strong position on, on, the, on, on the fact that Chinese are interfering, we are actually going to see less and less uh, a willingness on the side of the politics, particularly these three major political parties which are presenting the, the uh, three constituent groups uh, because they are mostly interested in the, in the capital and the Chinese are very much uh, willing to, to, to oil the deals. And unless the EU takes a stronger position when it comes to the, to the conditions that Bosnia and Herzegovina is to fulfill in, on, the, on the road to the, to the EU, and I'm, I'm actually worried that because of the, the, the Chinese approach to Bosnia, we are going to lose the, 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 the position when it comes to the EU approach. And then it's going to be really problematic, not only for Bosnia and Herzegovina, but for the region as well. And uh, that's something, so I would lo love to, I mean, I, I, I have been in, in touch with, with Vlado, but basically that, that is a component that for Bosnia in particular, because of the very complicated structure of Bosnia, I think that's, uh, that's something that, that should be taken into consideration when, when it comes to the recommendations over the EU. Thank you. Thank you very much, Leila. And uh, we have the uh, EAS here on the call as well. And Abigail Vasily would like to come in and comment. So, Vlado, you will still have to wait a little while until you can say something. I would like to bring Abigail into the conversation as well. 
Thanks, uh, thanks, Yanga, and it's uh, nice to be part of the conversation and to hear until you feel basically the moment that it's kind of the moment to reply. Um, and um, it's a fascinating discussion. I think one thing that is clear and where I acknowledge that we are missing facts um, and we are missing information. And I think the study is in a way very important in bringing what we need as well um, as decision makers to then be able to take uh, informed decision. Having said that, I think the trends are very clear and um, and we see a number of issues that echo what is going on in Europe as well. I mean, the question of influence, it's not a question only uh, for the region, it's also a question for the EU itself. And um, so basically, we're trying to address um, a set of issues in Europe and try to address them as well um, with, um, with the neighborhood. Um, as regards to the um, EU policy on China, I mean, you were pointing at the comprehensive agreement on investment and how can we reconcile that? And basically, this is all part um, of the push of um, the EU to have a, com a complex approach to China. I mean, t in 2018, um, the situation was uh, fairly different. The EU policy vis-a-vis -vis China was very straightforward. And over the past two years, what we have done is to inject a level of complexity. And in a way, the work is not yet done. Um, the work needs to continue. And I think the comprehensive agreement on investment only address um, one tiny issue, which is how to bring fair conditions for European companies in China. It does not, um, the aim is not to change the China regime. The aim is not to make the disagreements um, the core pillar and the core center of, um, of EU approach um, to China. Um, if I could add one thing, which is basically just to explain the way we see it from Brussels, uh, despite the fact that I hate saying we see it from Brussels this way, because actually we see it at 27 in the same way, uh, we have to track. And one fact is how do we engage with China and how do we refine this engagement in a complex geopolitical um, context uh, at a key moment where the Biden administration will certainly redefine the parameters of engagement for the European Union on China. And the second track is we have realized over the past four years that China brought challenges that we had not anticipated. The trajectory we thought is not the one that China is taking. So how do we make sure that our economies and citizens are protected? And this is basically a conversation that we have but probably not enough um, with our partners in the Western Balkans. And this is looking at um, autonomous measures that the EU is taking to protect its economies and its citizens. And that's a conversation that indeed we do have with our partner, be it our transatlantic partner or our, um, our neighborhood. Um, and um, ju just to give you an example, uh, today uh, I'm happy to say more about uh, the influence question, but Today, what we are looking at is um, the procurement instrument. So how um, do we make sure um, that we have a collective buy-in for an international procurement instrument? That's a key issue that for now we have not resolved. How do we address foreign subsidies? And there are a number of questions on which within the European Union, we are only thinking that through now um, and where the conversation in the Western Balkan is um, also happening to make sure that we are on the same page and on the same line. Um, as it comes um, to influence, I think it's a well-identified um, problem uh, that we are trying to tackle. Um, so for those of you with the Brussels press, you may have heard um, the HRVP saying yesterday in the European Parliament that we do not have the means to tackle this information uh, on China, um, well, maybe we do. Uh, uh, and, uh, it's a closed door. It's a closed door workshop, right, Yanka? 
No, no, no. This is on the record. <laughs> so we okay. Have <laughs> and so maybe we do and 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 maybe it's just about redefining the tools uh, at this stage but actually we are very well aware of the issue and we are tackling that thank you abigail and now Lara, you now you have the impossible task of you have two minutes left um so <laughs> pick whatever you would like to really comment on that is the most important thing to do uh, and then Stefan and you, you get both like one last sentence as well. So 90 seconds for you and then each one sentence. <laughs> okay, well, just very briefly, yes, on civil society, China is sort of beginning to learn the game, uh, so to speak. And, uh, you know, they are beginning to reach out to different civil society uh, organizations. I would cite the example of Bosnia and Herzegovina where ambassadors have been quite active talking to civil society people uh, and where the Chinese have been able to begin to support and generate presence uh, via different policy uh, you know, research institutes. Yes, they're mostly linked to the BRI initiative at the present time, but they're also increasingly present in academia. And uh, so these kind of you know, uh, linkages, again, that I was talking about are beginning, are beginning to show. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a kind of, it's a change, you know, it's a cultural change, it's a change in diplomatic culture as well, uh, but they're slowly going down that uh, road. And one final sentence on what we should expect, I think, in the next couple of years. Uh, one finding uh, of the research that I didn't really focus on, I see the beginnings of a very clear distinction between, a very clear differentiation between sectors where cooperation will be increasingly difficult because countries in the region have joined NATO, are on the way maybe of joining NATO or negotiating with the EU, and areas where I think the Chinese are still going to have uh, a loss of opportunities to engage and cooperate. So for instance, you know, obvious examples, 5G, energy, increasingly difficult. Uh, but once you go beyond that, maybe, you know, some types of infrastructure as well, critical infrastructure, this sort of thing. Uh, but once you go beyond that into business, economy, culture, academia, I see plenty of opportunities for the Chinese into the next decade. And Stefan, where do you see China and Europe in 10 years time? Uh, just a very brief answer in the Western Balkans. Oh, you're still muted. Uh, none of the Western Balkan countries will join EU in the next 10 years, and China will stay a relevant third actor in the region. Excellent. That was short and snappy. And with this, we're at 3.31 and my clock. This is almost good for a German. We almost made it on time. <laughs> <laughs> And I wish all of you a wonderful afternoon. Uh, let me please uh, reiterate my thanks to my wonderful colleagues in the Sophia office from ECFR for putting all of this together, all those behind the scenes and all those on the screen. Uh, thank you also to Rockefeller Brothers Fund and the Balkan Trust for Democracy for their support for this event. Um, and I hope and I, that we have demonstrated that there is ample um, opportunity to discuss and ample need to discuss uh, the issues in further detail to engage with all the actors in the region to get all of the different perspectives on the uh, on the table. So I think Vesela, we have a task here at hand of just kind of continuing uh, to work on the issue and to bringing these discussions to the heart of the European policy process um, and to just kind of enlarge the, the audience for these conversations. So with this, thank you to all of you. Uh, and you. Uh, I will yeah, I wish you all a wonderful afternoon wherever you are at the moment, whether in the region or at the heart of Europe or um, wh wh wherever you find yourself joining us. Um, see you hopefully soon. Thank you, Yanka. Bye. Bye-bye.